Hey everyone, welcome. I'm so happy to have you here. I'm so happy to start a new edition of Human Dialogues. As you know, every month the International Institute of Humanology focuses on a human topic. And that is the topic that we work on uh, throughout the whole month. And we invite experts and we organize panels and we do a lot of things related to that topic so we can gain clarity. We can listen to different ideas, um, obtain different perspectives, and grow as human beings. The topic that was selected for this month is none other than the past, how to deal with the past. And I have a very, very, very special guest on the show today who's going to give us, I am completely certain, a lot of food for thought. Not only was he a historian as a teacher in his, in his professional career, which of course gives us a little understanding of where his background on the past comes from, but he also had a very unique kind of life that I think is also going to inspire us to look into possible approaches to the past that maybe we had not considered before. I am extremely happy and really proud to have this person on the show, also because he's a very distant relative of mine. Let me just tell you uh, that a few years ago, as I was studying our family tree, I happened to bump into this gentleman that you're going to be meeting in a few seconds. And well, we, have, we happen to be really very, 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 very distantly related, but we somehow connected immediately and we've been in contact ever since. And as I said, it's a great delight for me to introduce him because he is, as you will see, a wonderful human being and an incredible character. I'm talking about none other than Larry Melton. Hi, Melton, how are you? I am wonderful, thank you. And a delight to be here. I am so happy to have you on this show. For those of you who don't know it, um, he is in the United States, right, Melton? Yes, Missouri. And although his name... Place. Sorry, sorry about that. Although his name is Larry, he's always gone by Melton. Yes, yes. Uh, we, we was Mr. Melton for a long time, but I prefer just my last name. And, we, and we've been using it, yeah. And we will be using it too. So well, as I, just, as I was just telling our audience, you were a history teacher, right? I did. Uh, that was most of my career, though it was, um, it was, um, uh, I, I bounced around a lot as a young fellow. Um, uh, my wife was a registered nurse for 50 years, but I only had a 30 year uh, history career. The rest of the time, I did almost everything, and uh, it informed my my teaching and uh, i'm grateful for it now but it seems a bit um a, a bit of a collage sometimes when i look back on it mm -hmm. and why history what got you interested into history you know i never quite understood except i i was inspired by my high school history teacher as I look back on uh, Mrs. Prue, she wasn't a particularly good teacher, but she was so excited about what she was teaching. And I thought, if I could spend my life as excited about something as she is, that's not a bad thing. Um, I had lots of negatives in my life back then, and that kind of, of, of a optimistic plus, I thought, had something going for it. Plus, I found when I started studying it in college that I had an aptitude for, for research. So that, that's the best I can explain right now. But inspiration is part of it, big part of it. 
So you, I think, are 80 right now, right, Milton? I'm sorry? You're 80 years old? 80, yes. Um, unbelievable. <laughs> I, uh, I never imagined I would rack up this much history. Uh, but I stay young because I have a friend in, uh, in Duluth, Minnesota, who's 97. And we talk by phone every day. And I'm his junior, so I feel very youthful when I talk to my friend. <laughs> but that's not the only thing you do, Melton. For those of you who are listening and watching right now, or those of you who are going to be watching this later, Melton is an incredibly, incredibly busy man. He writes for our magazine. Every month he sends us an article on the joy of aging. You know, we have our monthly magazine, Mas Humanos, where he contributes every month with this article, but he does many other things and he contributes with many other organizations every month. He's really, really active, right, Milton? Sitting right where I am now, I, I have activities that stretch around the world, across the country, and mostly in music, which was not really related to my career at all, but avocationally, um, I go back in, in American jazz and ragtime music, mm. and I have become um, very involved in those communities. And the music is so joyful. It, it, it's just been such a blessing to, to spend time now in my dotage of being able to be surrounded by happy, joyful people and the music. And so that's that occupies a good deal of my time. Um, and I'll spare you d more descriptions because I have some wonderful projects afoot. <laughs> and everything you do, you do with this joy, with this uh, will to live and to do things. Although I know that you've had a lot of sadness in your life, in your past. And the main topic of today's interview is letting go of the past. I know that you had to learn how to let go. Would you like to share some of your yes. past history with us so people understand a little bit who you are? Yes, it's not a pretty story. Uh, but... But I've, I've wanted to share because I know so many who have similar, in similar situations, and they're, they're despondent about it. And I, I want people to know there's recovery from, from the kind of manic and depression uh, I experienced through the first 60 years of my life. And it was severe. And it was t terribly difficult on my son and my wife, who are the most extraordinary people. In fact, I, I can think of very few who would have stayed with me in the mental state that I, I was in uh, for so long. And I, I, I did not seek help. I, I knew I had a problem, and yet it was it almost reached the point of, uh, of I was addicted to to my my poor mental health. Strangely, because of the care of my dear wife and and son, um, uh, I was prepared when something rather miraculous happened. I was diagnosed with Parkinson's disease about 20 years ago. Uh, not a nice thing to have on your medical chart, to be honest with you, but it's the best thing that ever happened to me. Because the medication that my physician, who was a brilliant man, prescribed took care of that little chemical tweaking or whatever it took in my brain to level out my mental health. And as my Parkinson's symptoms, which 
20 years later, are still remarkably stable. As those were dealt with, it also dealt with that manic depressive swings that my mind would go through. To the point that as you grow older, of course, ill health does happen. And, um, and I unfortunately lost my wife six years ago. I would have not survived those, those events in my life had I not had that, that, that miraculous stability, mental stability. Well, you can't recover or even partially recover from something that was that severe and not be grateful. <laughs> and I, I cannot express the gratitude that I have for living the last 20 years in, in joy. Through tragedy and grief, I never would have imagined. I have still been able to, to, to live delightfully. And I have a, a, an incredible family. One son, six grandchildren, and seven great-grandchildren now, and growing. And every one of them are their grandmother's children. They are precious. And that's my story. You don't have to live with this awfulness. It's an incredible story, Melton. It's really admirable. And it makes me wonder, don't you have any regrets? Don't you have any remorse? Don't you have any anger? Don't you have... Because when people have issues in their past, they usually turn them into those emotions. Yes, this is right. And I did. Uh-huh. But... I'm, I'm, I'm hesitating because it's both emotional and almost beyond explanation that I had in my life people who could forgive unforgivable behaviors. And I say that because I have sat many a time, and my son just left, by the way, many a time with my son, one time had to tell me the worst thing I think a parent could hear from a child, and then that is that he grew up afraid of his father and still has been able to forgive that. Now, again, it's, it's like my recovery. If you can't deal with that past yourself and, and put it aside, then that's the height of ingratitude and audaciousness because I've been given that gift, both by my wife and my son, to be able to say, uh, you know, look what you're doing. We're proud of you now. Uh, we forgive what you did. And they always come back to now, when you forgive yourself, you will have recovered. And that's an ongoing process because, as you're assuming, it's hard to do. I was going to get, get to that right now. <laughs> it is a very difficult task. And I have wavered and uh, faltered. And yet, how can I not, when those so offended have been able to? And so... so but it's it I don't want to imply it's an obligation. It is simply something that must must happen. And I'm I think it's a 20-year process, but it's ongoing. Um and again, I'm I'm so blessed. It's just hard to 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 sit here and be angry about anything. I want to share something, may share some light on it. In my worst days, when I would go into my um, depression periods, very dark, and I, I had real anger issues, um, not physical, but, but very, uh, 
very psychological anger issues. And I would find myself doing and saying things as if I had a split personality. I watched myself do and say these terrible things while at the same time wanting to stop that person from doing it as if I was two people, but one impotent to do anything about it. Now, my son has fed off of that, that knowing that kind of a situation. At first, he, he couldn't understand, and then he, uh, he was angry. He said, well, okay, if you knew you were doing something wrong, why did you continue to do it to people that you love? Which almost made it even worse. It doubled the, the, the situation. But then he came to, he came to, well, we've both been reading a lot about it, and it's not an uncommon thing for, uh, for people in, in, in different mental health situations to, to, to almost behave out of mind uh, and not be able to function in mind. Now that I am of, what, 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 what do they say for? full mind, so I can at least write a will now. Um, <laughs> the, the past is, is very much there. One of the joys of aging, however, and my older friend and I talk about this all the time, it's funny how the older we get, the more we take the edge off of the negativity of the past. Um, my grandson would call it forgetfulness. <laughs> um, uh, I don't call it dementia or forgetfulness. I just remind him that I've packed so much between my ears in 80 years that it takes me longer to retrieve information than it used to. <laughs> but the fact is, our minds do tend to put, to suppress the negative if we let them. If I sit and dwell on it, I can I can bring it back. I can bring it back with all of the horror that I originally experienced. But I have to make myself do it. And if you don't, then I guess that's letting go. Yes, that is. And. Are you aware of any tool, technique, strategy that you might have used throughout all those years to let go of the past? Maybe any tips and idea that we could share with people who are watching and listening? Because there will be people needing those ideas. And uh, I will share something if you want me to. Yes. Um, we at the Institute created a method called, uh, called Absolute Forgiveness, which focuses on really letting go of, th of uh, the past. The way we understand it at the Institute is there are three levels of forgiveness. And most people use one, maximum two levels. The first one is what we call intellectual or mental forgiveness. That is when you somehow analyze the situation and cognitively decide that it is best for you to let the story go. And then you choose to forgive the other person or persons, and that's a mental decision. Sometimes that's not enough, or sometimes the situation is so that you have to take another step and you have to forgive sentimentally or emotionally. Those cases could be like, for example, there is somebody you think wronged you and you intellectually believe they are wrong and they did wrong, but there is an emotional, sentimental reason through, for which you decide to forgive those people. Maybe you say, well, the greater love is more important than whatever they did. That's a second level. But many people, stay there. And in spite of intellectually and emotionally forgiving, the past keeps crawling back onto their lives and grabbing them and uh, blocking them. 
And that's where we say we need to reach absolute forgiveness, which is a lot more complex. And it is, in our teachings, it is a complete process that requires different levels of understanding why the person could have done what they did. Forgiving doesn't mean condoning or accepting at all. Forgiving is for myself, not for the person I'm forgiving. There's a lot of things involved in this. And that is something we teach the people who come to work with us. I don't know if any of the things I just said rings a bell or sounds familiar or feels familiar, or if there's anything else you would like to add to what I just said, Melton. Hard to add to anything you would say. I, it resonates, very much resonates with my experience. I spent most of those 60 up and down years exploring a religious solution to my problem. And by the way, I was always trying to find a, a way out of that, that quagmire. It, 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 the the harder I searched, and and by the way, I did I, I did gain a great deal from some meditative practices that I found extremely helpful. Um, of all things, and I'm about as far from the Catholic Church as you could become, but but some Catholic monks. Uh, 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 Thomas, Father Keating of the um, Capetian monks in Kentucky, of all places, was very <laughs> helpful. Um, uh, uh, at any rate, I won't go into the specifics, but I found that I, ha- I had to let go of, of, of a religious connection. I guess because of my empirical side, I just couldn't find... Uh, the, the comfort in the religions that that other people seem to to find so easily. So I looked elsewhere, and what I discovered was that human beings, I guess, we're all coping in a way as we as we develop our life philosophy, and without without sharing it because it is so individual, I have found such contentment in my explanation of of life and our our humanity and our connectedness. And and in a way, I think much of the rest of the world knows this channel that it took me so long to discover. And it is simply that we are, everything is connected that my individual self is so important, and yet in the scheme of things, my my eternity is is part of the whole. And I'm a little tiny molecule, and that keeps this ego in check. <laughs> it's been very helpful. <laughs> it, it, it tends to, to explode sort of like an American politician we all know and <laughs> and, and keeping it inside my skull is um, th- it's been very helpful in doing that I think I think our ego sometimes can get away from us and uh, certainly got away from me um, d- depression after all is all about the the end- it, it's just dark and bleak and I, well, I'm, I'm I'm meandering now, but I have found such peace and such contentment uh, in my formulating what I think is 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 true, and I anger my friends who uh, who are very content with their religious practice and belief because I won't explain mine. <laughs> They don't understand that mine is so uniquely individual, I would be afraid it would harm somebody else's thinking. And I'm I'm just not um, 
I'm not comfortable sharing it, but I'm comfortable having it. So would you share, uh, would you say then, Milton, that spirituality somehow helped you let go of? I was going there. I think I was too wrapped up in theology, in religion, in, in, in beef. And I sat back and I realized, well, hey, I know some of these things. I don't believe them. I know what's going on out there. Uh, it, it took me 80 years to discover what your daughter is probably studying in environmental ecology right now, that we are connected, that there's a balance to, to the world, to the universe. And what you're doing in, in, in helping us live together is of inestimable importance because we, I don't think humanity has ever been more, more do, unnecessarily divided. And when we realize we are brothers and sisters and take pride in each other and forgive each other, <laughs> well, that's exactly what your, your work has been all about. And I've been blessed to watch it grow for the last seven and it's amazing. Thank you so much, Melton. <laughs> seed has the, uh, oh my goodness, I can go on and on. Melton, I would like to approach the topic of letting go okay. in a different sense, a different perspective. You're 80 years old, and I know you lost your dear wife, for example. I'm sure you lost a lot of dear people throughout the years. And letting go of people could be as hard as letting go of the past or even harder. Would you say there is a similarity in letting go? I mean, is letting go something that people learn and they can apply it for everything? I don't know how to approach that. First of all, here's my wife. I, uh, I don't know if that comes up or not. Um, I'll have to admit, I have not even considered letting go of, of my wife. Well, what, and yes, I have. I've let go of having her. Mm -hmm. I have not let go of what she did and how she changed my life. And, and, and I really don't want to go there. But oh, it took me a couple of years to let go of her because, um, as I told you a little bit earlier, um, when I got COVID, I, my doctor said that I, I already was at risk for 12 of the eight risk factors. I always thought I would die early. And I was so prepared for her to live either alone or as she chose, but have everything in order for me. We had nothing. In, her mother lived to 96. So I just assumed that she would survive me by generations. Didn't happen. It was awful. And um, it took me a long while to let go of her. Somebody said I should stop wearing my wedding ring. Because I made a vow to death do us part. I've let her go, but I've not let her go. Yes, I what get she, what she was, what she meant. And 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 of course, it's hard to let someone go when you've got six grandchildren and seven grandchildren who remind you of her. But your point is well taken. I had to let Karen go. Mm -hmm. She's such a part of our lives. And she meant so much to the whole family. Mm -hmm. And we were all there when she passed away, which made it hard. Yeah, I can imagine. It's a different kind of situation, but we at home are also going through a process of letting go. My yeah. husband 
was just let go of his company. He was just retired, early retirement. And that also is a process where we have to learn to let go. We have to learn to let go of the past that was a certain way. And we have to embrace a new present that is or could be potentially very, very different. I know you've gone through processes like that because of your uh, profession, because of your life experience. Is there anything you would recommend people to consider when facing these kinds of situations where they have to let go of a certain maybe lifestyle, a certain situation in their, in their regular lives? This is probably too simplistic. My dad had a, a wonderful term he would apply to what you're talking about. He said, you know, in life, You have to be nimble. Mm -hmm. But I think the best advice is, first of all, for every couple to realize someday one of them will be alone. To realize someday you will retire or I had to retire because of Parkinson's. I wasn't ready. It was hard to give up a career I enjoyed, but it was, it was necessary. So the change was forced on me even more so than, than people in your situation. And yet I don't want to make light of it. It's a major adjustment. But I think people who have lived full and rich lives surrounded by as many amazing people as you can collect The transitions, it, it's easier to be nimble. Mm -hmm. and, and to, and, but to live your life not expecting that things are not going to change. I think that's the problem with my friends who are struggling so much with old age. Uh, my mother-in-law at 96 spent about three days in the hospital before she died and she couldn't understand why because she'd been healthy all her life. <laughs> she, she was, she had no clue that she was dying of old age and that it, it gets us. So I guess this is oversimple to, to your wonderful question But it's important that people not live as if things are not going to change, because in this day and age, they are. And, and uh, I won't go into the details, but I came down with a literally a sudden case of COVID that nearly took my life in hours and went from my, my usual healthy 12 risk factor life to gasping for air and not having much more time had the paramedics not showed up. So change is going to happen. And if we aren't mentally prepared for it, it's going to be a terrible, terrible experience. Um, you there in the heart of your activities, I'm terribly optimistic for your futures your family's future, but I don't underestimate what you'll have to go through for the change, mm -hmm. physical and um, psychological. Yeah, we, we just, we, we live as children. Little children don't like change. I, I taught elementary school long enough to see that the more routine you can stay in, the better, more comfortable they are. But we're not children anymore. We've got to be realistic. And um, we are all terminal. And if we live positively with that in mind, and not negatively as many do, I think that's a big step toward adjusting to, to change. You know, you've taught optimism ever since I've known you. Just you, you embody the optimistic spirit. Yeah, the there's there's something you said there, Melton. You said that we are all doomed. We're all going to die. 
So we might as well enjoy every moment, you know? <laughs> what and else is there? And be productive, that there's no greater satisfaction than productivity, mm -hmm. positive productivity. My, my, my contemporaries are on the golf course this morning, and I, I shouldn't put that down, and yet, uh, other than their physical um, uh, well-being, perhaps, I just see all of their gifts and skills and talents that could be used somewhere to their great satisfaction, and um, and yet they are satisfying themselves by beating par. And, and I have trouble with that, and I shouldn't be that judgmental. But I just, I just, um, well, we've earned our living off of the public. Now it's time to to give back in our retirement. And that there's another side to that. It just reminds me that it has a lot to do with the past. We are wasted. Yes, I always say are, that. Always. Oh, <laughs> and, and not only that, we're being paid to waste it. Yes. Paid, well, not all of us, and, and I'm overgeneralizing, but I hope uh, everybody's understanding that I've always thought of retirement as more of an obligation than a, than a relaxation, though you should be comfortable, of course. Um, but I have been so fulfilled with the volunteer work that I have done. And of course, everything now is, and uh, I'd, 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 well, I'd be a hopeless uh, wreck if I didn't have something positive to, to do. But see, Melvin, I think, I think precisely that. There's a lot of societies in the world in which when you're growing old, they just park you in a corner or they put you or they place you in a home and they just kind of close the gate on you. They cage you and there's nothing you can do about it because, well, that's what's expected. That's what everybody does. And in ancient cultures, the elderly were the source of knowledge and the source of experience. And they were their teachers of younger generations. Whereas today, younger generations seem to, to believe they know it all. And they don't want to learn from anybody else, which is absolutely wrong. And it's the world turned upside down completely. And I think I agree with you. It's a complete waste. It's a waste of skills, a waste of knowledge, a waste of ideas, a waste of support, a waste of so many things. And still, that's where we're going. There's certain societies that are tougher on that than others. I was uh, a few years ago, about three, four years ago, I was in Mexico. And I was uh, invited to speak to a group of uh, elderly people. About 2,000 people attended the talk. And I was asked to speak about optimism in old age. And my main message was, you know what, guys, a lot of you lost your optimism because you were told you're worthless, whereas you should be more optimistic than ever because you know that you have a lot to share and a lot to give. But you're the ones who have to stand up for yourselves because nobody else is going to do it for you. That's still your job. So I agree with you, Melton. People have a lot to give. And some choose not to give, but many would be very happy to share. Agree. And, and part of it's cultural preparation for old age. We, at least where I am, are not preparing our, our populations to grow old at the same time that we are growing older and older than ever. Um, my lifespan already is just unimaginable as I was growing up. But no, I, I, I think activity, I think positivity, but I think to live our lives as, a, yes, we can retire from a job, but not from our 
our obligation to serve and be human and uh, to the best of our ability, uh, be productive as long as we can. And thanks to this kind of technology, tell you quickly about my friend in Duluth. Max Morath was one of the great entertainers of his time. He was he was Irving Berlin and George C. Cohen and Fanny Bryce and uh, uh, all of the early turn of the century entertainers in one man. And he was the father of the educational documentary that our Ken Burns is so well known. In 1960, he produced a series, several series of programs that the, the, the public television said not just instructed, but they entertained us and taught us that information and knowledge is fun. Well, Max has had this incredible career, an 80-year career until physically he was no longer able to play the piano. And and dance across the floor lightly and do all the wonderful things he was famous for. And now he sits in a hospice care facility at 97. And I won't say he's forgotten because he is he is revered by the, the community that, that uh, he was part of, but he is still not able to be as uh, in front of the public and serving the public as he once did. And, and um, in a way, we're both in the same situation. Max has always said entertainment follows technology, and we in our old age are benefiting from what we're doing right now in, in a remarkable way. And I would I would encourage those who are moving into their seniority to not eschew technology, but rather embrace it. And who knows when a child or a grandchild will move far away and you will relish these moments, and what do they call it? FaceTime. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and they are true. Again, I ramble, and yet um, th th that's been very meaningful in my life, is keeping up with the technology to, to the degree we can do this. Almost didn't get on, but we did. <laughs> yes, we did. <laughs> Milton, we are out of time. It was fantastically instructive, entertaining, and fun to talk with you again. Always. You, you inspire me. You, you you bring joy and you radiate a positive optimism that uh, unlike anyone I know. So thank you. Dear, dear, <laughs> thank dear. you, Melton. Thank you. I know that a lot of people will be watching the, the show if they're not watching it right now. So any last piece of advice for those who are wanting to know how to let go? It, enjoy your life. Embrace the, your loved ones and your friends. Be nimble. <laughs> I love it. Thank you, Melton. Thank you so much. And to all those of you who are watching or who will be watching later, if you have any questions or any comments, please write them down. If you're watching this on uh, YouTube, give us a like. And remember that every month there is at least one human dialogue on a human topic with a human being that is really interesting. Larry Melton, thank you, thank you. once more. Continue taking care, please. Yes, indeed. Thank Bye. Bye-bye. <laughs>